The 25-year-old Nadine, a Nading major, lived with her husband Mark and their infant son Dan in an apartment in Willoughby, Ohio, in 1980. When Mark returned home from work on January 11, 1980, he found Nadine's body in their dining room. She had been stabbed more than 40 times. Just a few feet from her body was their son, still in his living room playpen. Fortunately, he was unharmed. During the initial investigation, Willoughby police determined that Nadine's life was taken sometime between 1.15 p.m. and 4.45 p.m. There were no signs of forced entry nor evidence that she had been assaulted. Nothing seemed to be missing from the home except the weapon, which came from Nadine's kitchen. The person who took her life did, however, leave something behind. His blood was found on Nadine's shirt. A significant amount of blood belonging to an unknown male was located on Nadine's shirt, police said. Some of the suspect's blood on Nadine's shirt was in the form of perpendicular drops, indicating that the suspect was standing on top of Nadine while he was bleeding. A neighbor of Nadine noticed a canary yellow car parked in the rear of their apartment complex around the time her life was taken. It was not a car that belonged to anyone living in the complex. Investigators followed up on the lead, but unfortunately, it did not lead anywhere, and the case went cold. In 2015, police received new information based on the DNA found on Nadine's clothing. After establishing a partnership with the Lake County Crim Lab, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations, and the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, they later teamed up with the Lake County Prosecutor's Office and Parabon Nano Labs to build a family tree from the DNA profile. Ultimately, this led them to Stephen Joseph Simcak through the use of genetic genealogy. Investigators compared the male DNA from Bloodnating shirt to one of Simcak's biological children and found a match. People who knew Simcak then confirmed he had owned a canary yellow Dodge Dart back in 1980. Authorities then looked into Simcak's work record from his 37-year career at Lincoln Electric Company in Euclid, Ohio, which is less than 10 miles from Willoughby. In 1980, Simcak only missed one day of work, the day Nadine's life was taken. Simcak was due in for a second shift that day and called in sick. Police also learned that at the time, Simcak had other jobs, delivering flowers for Wycliffe Laurel and working with Antonio's winery in Wycliffe, just a few miles southwest of both his and Nadine's home. Simcak retired in 2002 and moved to Bemos Point, New York, about 60 miles southwest of Buffalo, according to police. He passed away at 79 in 2018, leaving behind a wife, three biological children, and two children. Nadine's husband, Mark Major, had this to say at a press conference held by police. He stole Nadine from her family and friends. Most of all, he stole Nadine from me and my son. How could he get up every day and look himself in the mirror knowing what he did? She did not deserve this, he continued. If there's a place in hell, I know he's in it, and I hope he rots there. Mark continued that Nadine did not know Simcak, leaving loved ones and investigators puzzled about a possible motive. Nadine's son Dan had this to say at the press conference. I am angry that Stephen passed away as a free and carefree citizen before he could be identified as well as caught, and in turn, given the ability for questions to be asked and justice to be served. The 18-year-old Barbara Jean Jepson and her husband, Joe Jepson, lived in Van Nuys, California, in January 1956. The couple got married the previous year, and Barbara was four months pregnant. Joe worked for the National Air Guard. On January 31, 1956, Joe went to work early in the morning. Barbara was last seen shopping at 12.30 p.m. When Joe returned home, he found Barbara's body in their bed. She had been fatally stabbed. After the gruesome discovery, Joe first covered up his wife with a blanket and then called the police. Detectives who responded to the Jefferson house that day found several items of evidence, such as a green army jacket with blood and hair follicles in the garage. One witness told police that a person was seen leaving the area that day wearing a green jacket. Another talked about seeing a man with big hands and big knuckles. Unfortunately, investigators back then didn't know how great DNA would eventually be at solving cold cases. So items such as the pillowcases, bed sheets, and a bloody rag found in the sink at the Jepson home were not collected. At the time, detectives believed that what happened to Barbara was linked to a series of assaults in the same area. They tracked down every man who had committed similar crimes in the area to question them. 
Unfortunately, this did not lead anywhere, and the case went cold. In 2019, Los Angeles Police Detective Rachel Evans took another look at Barbara's case. It was the very first case she was assigned to after joining the cold case unit. On her first day, a veteran detective handed her the case file and said good luck. By the time she started working on it, hundreds of detectives already combed through it over the past 60 years. It took Evans a week to read through the entire case file. Then she read it a second time and started taking notes. The third time she read through the file, she started noticing a lot of things. One of the things she picked up on was that there was no forced entry at the Jepsons' home. It seemed to Evans that Barbara knew the person who attacked her. She also noticed that no valuables were taken, and nothing was out of place. As Evans reviewed the case, it wasn't long before she started focusing on one man, a man from Utah by the name of Monner Merce. Merce was born on May 24, 1911, in Mount Pleasant, Utah. In 1931, he married Cleo Rehm, and the couple had one son and one daughter. They were later divorced, and Merz married another woman, Bernice, in the San Fernando Valley. That marriage also ended in divorce in 1945, with Bernice citing cruelty. By then, Merz was an avid gambler, violent towards animals, a womanizer, and a raging alcoholic. He was also the suspect in many assault cases. By 1948, he moved in with a woman named Fern Spivey in San Fernando Valley and stayed with her for years. At the time Merz and Spiva began living together, she had a 10-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. That daughter is Barbara. Evans believed that Merz abused her along the way because that was kind of his modus operandi. He would marry young women who had young girls and then go on to abuse them. In 1955, when Barbara married Joe, Merz married his fourth wife. This woman also had a young daughter. In 1960, 15-year-old Mary and Pedrada, who had a horse stable next to Merz and often rode horses with him, was found fatally stabbed. Then in 1962, Merz married his fifth wife, Anna. She too had a young daughter. In 1964, Mott Merz was arrested and accused of abusing a 14-year-old girl. Information on that case was hard for Evans to collect because the case file had been destroyed. Although it is clear that Merz was involved in many crimes, this was the only victim for which he was arrested. Also, in 1964, while waiting for the trial, Merz showed up at a hospital with a gunshot wound. He claimed that it was an accidental shooting. Who shot Merz and why was never determined. By 1965, all of Merz's crimes were coming to a head. He was given a polygraph test by police who asked him about what happened to Barbara Jefferson. He denied even knowing her. Investigators knew that he was at her funeral and that he knew her since she was 10 because he was married to her mom for some time. The polygraph test results concluded that Mers had definite guilty knowledge regarding the fate of Barbara. On August 15, 1965, while Mers was out of jail and with numerous questions looming about what else he had been involved with, his wife, Anna, found underwear from a young girl in a drawer in their house. She confronted Mers about whether he had also been abusing that girl. The confrontation was apparently the last straw as Mers proceeded to grab a gun from inside the house. He chased Ana into the street where he fatally shot her. He then went back inside the house and took his own life. Recently, a former stepdaughter of Mers called the police to tell them about 15-year-old Mary and Pedrada, the girl who often rode horses with Mers and who was stabbed nine times. The stepdaughter told police that she was 10 years old at the time. She remembers that on the day that Mary and lost her life, Mers came into the house with a bloody knife and blood on his hands and clothing. The stepdaughter waited until he and his entire family were no longer alive until she told police. That's how scared she was. She told police that she still had nightmares of him every night. Evans would soon learn that Mers had a pattern of never leaving his victims alone, even after he remarried or when his stepdaughters grew up and moved out of the house. According to Evans' research, five women were seen at the funeral wearing black and crying. Evans said, so he was kind of a womanizer. He had all these women that he connected with and kind of kept. There's a lot of stories around him with these young girls that were abused by him. Until the day Barbara's mom passed away, even though they were no longer married, Mers would still visit her. That's why Evans believes on the day that Barbara's life was taken, Mers showed up at her residence and did not need to break into her house. As you'll remember, one of the witnesses saw a man wearing a green jacket with big hands and big knuckles, 
Big hands and big knuckles were something the Murs family was known for. A drawing of the person believed to have committed the assaults in the area showed a man who wore a plaid shirt. Evan said that Murs was also known to always wear a plaid shirt. He was wearing one in his mug shot taken in his 1964 arrest. Most of his victims had their hands bound during their attacks, and the same was the case with Barbara. Despite the lack of DNA evidence that still exists today from the crime scene, Evans attempted to use today's DNA technology to help solve the case. After some extensive research, Evans was able to track down Murr's relatives still living in Utah in 2019, including his children. Evans gives big kudos to Draper Police and Unified Police for assisting her investigation. In September 2019, a search warrant for DNA was served to Murr's 87-year-old son. Murr's son passed away just two weeks after the DNA was collected. Unfortunately, it was ultimately determined there was not enough DNA from the crime scene to compare with the DNA collected from Murr's son. Evans said now that police have it preserved, they will revisit the case about every five years to see if advances in DNA knowledge get to the point so that the old DNA can finally be tested and compared to familial DNA from Murr's. Even though the DNA from the crime scene is too weak to prove 100% it was Murr's, investigators believe now in 2022, they have more than enough evidence against Murr's that if he were still alive, he would be found guilty of taking Barbara's life. Investigators have also been able to clear other suspects using the DNA. One of these people was Barbara's husband, Joe. Even though he was cleared by the police in the initial investigation, he lived the rest of his life with a stigma surrounding him. Some members of the community questioned his innocence since he was the one who found his wife's body. Joe remarried and had two sons. Although the boys always believed their father was innocent, Evans said it was especially satisfying to be able to call them earlier this year and tell them that their father had conclusively been cleared. On the other side, Evans said Merz's grandchildren were upset when she told them what kind of person their grandfather really was. They had been told that he had passed away in a car accident. The grandchildren took the pictures they had of him out of their homes and threw them away. To solve Barbara's case, Evans said she took a page from the detectives of the 1950s, pounding the pavement and turning over rocks looking for clues. But Evans also has her own gift for striking up conversations with people. People have a lot of info to share. So you sit back and listen to them, she said. In addition to having to prove herself to the veteran detectives, Evans admits she felt solving the case was something she had to do for Barbara Jefferson's family so that they could finally have some peace about what happened. She admits that at times, she felt guided as she worked to solve the six decades old cold case. I think people are crying from the dust for justice. Their families need it. I know it's not my family, but there's somebody who's still crying over this. You had a husband that passed away that people always had suspicion about. So for me, you get closure for the families to know that their dad was good or their mom was great. You know you have some peace for them because they lived all these years with no peace. So for me and others I work with, we do this so the families can have rest. I can't bring them back, but the families can have rest. Five-year-old Stephanie Haybert lived in Wageman, Louisiana, in 1978. One summer's day in June, Stephanie left her Astro Lane home at about 2.30 p.m., heading to a friend's house to play. She was wearing a pink checker top, pink shorts, and her ice blue prescription glasses. However, she never made it to her friend's house, and she did not return home for dinner. Concerned, her parents, Joyce and Donald Haybert, called 911 to report her missing. Joyce was quoted as saying, This is hell. I wouldn't wish this on anyone, not even the devil. A multi-day search of the family's neighborhood ensued, and the FBI joined the case. Investigators ran down tip after tip, and the Haberts even hired psychics, but no sign of Stephanie could be found. Five months later, a hunter discovered Stephanie's partial skeletal remains in a wooded area down a shell road in Royal St. Charles Parish in Louisiana, about 20 miles from Stephanie's home. Her body was tied up against a tree, and investigators could not determine how she lost her life, but they could confirm that she had been assaulted. Detectives focused on Stephanie's then, 16, year, old neighbor, Roger Alexander. Stephanie was friends with his little sister, and she attended a sleepover at their house the night before she disappeared. Alexander maintained his innocence, stating that on the day Stephanie went missing, he was a few blocks away at his cousin's house on Danny Lyon Drive. 
helping repair a car. Several witnesses vouched for him. Still, investigators insisted that Alexander was responsible. St. Charles Parish prosecutors presented a case against him to a grand jury, but they declined to indict Alexander. The Wageman neighbors who searched through the summer heat for Stephanie watched from their lawns as investigators repeatedly searched Alexander's home. Even after a 2008 DNA test excluded him, authorities did not declare him innocent. Suspicion also fell on 70-year-old Daniel Parks, a friend of the Habert family who babysat Stephanie. In 2014, he was sentenced to life in prison, convicted of assaulting a 7-year-old girl in 1979. The victim in this case testified that Parks once told her she would end up like poor Stephanie. Parks denied harming Stephanie, and investigators could not find any evidence that he was involved. In 2003, Stephanie's mother Joyce contacted a man named Michael, who was the chief of the district attorney's victims and witness assistant division. Michael recalls that Joyce said to him when they first met, her case is just sitting there. Please do something. All I know is my child was tied to a tree and left for animals to get her. Michael met with prosecutors and detectives seeking new ways to identify the person responsible. In 2012, a distraught Jay Franklin reached out to Mackle and said that he knows who took Stephanie's life. Jay said that his father, Jason Franklin Sr., was responsible. Jason was a U.S. Army veteran who married Joyce Vinette in 1970 in New Orleans and worked as an electrician. The couple bought a home on Esther Lane, about five houses from Stephanie's home. Jason was a serial predator who targeted children. In 1966, he was convicted of attempted assault on a young girl. Jay Franklin reached out to Mackle because his wife, Michelle Franklin, had convinced him he'd never have peace until he spoke up. Since childhood, Jay had bounced between homes, abused and traumatized by what he had been through. He was mentally damaged. Michelle Franklin said, He didn't know what love was until he got with me. Over the next nine years, Jay Franklin revealed physical abuse he had suffered at Jason Franklin Sr.'s hands and how it links to Stephanie's case. Jay said that his father beat him and assaulted him between the ages of two and six. Jason Franklin Sr. also used his son to lure other victims, usually young girls, to their home under the pretense of a play date. Young Jay Franklin was sometimes forced to take part. Jay then told investigators that one of those girls was Stephanie Habert. According to him, it was his mother, Joyce Finette, who abducted Stephanie and brought her to Jason Franklin Sr. Since both Jay and Stephanie's mothers are called Joyce, I'll refer to Jay's mother as Vinette to prevent any confusion. Jay said that when he was six years old, Vinette had coaxed Stephanie into their car. Vinette then drove the children to a house in Luling, Louisiana, where Jason Franklin Sr. was waiting. At some point, he put Stephanie into a car and told Vinette to follow. They then drove to a wooded area where Stephanie's body would later be found. Jason Franklin Sr. stripped Stephanie of her clothes and took Polaroid pictures of the child, forcing Jay to pose with her. Jay remembers Stephanie tearfully declaring, I'm telling my daddy. He believes this may have sealed her fate. Vinette then left with Jay. Jay told investigators that he saw his father binding Stephanie to a tree as they pulled away. When confronted by detectives, Joyce Bennett denied any involvement and called her son a liar. While speaking with investigators, Jay Franklin took detectives to some of Jason Franklin Sr.'s favorite hunting spots. They eventually ended up in a rural area of St. Charles Parish. Without realizing it, he directed them to the scene where Stephanie was found. Despite Jay Franklin's testimony, it still took authorities years to prepare the case. They had to determine what evidence was admissible, what charges he'd be eligible for, and definitely rule out the other suspects. J. Franklin's credibility was bolstered by the statements of another victim who came forward. It was a 51-year-old woman whose story of childhood matched the version of events he told. She had never before disclosed the assaults. In 2018, 76-year-old Jason Franklin Sr. was arrested in connection to Stephanie's case. Her parents, Donald and Joyce, lived long enough to see him arrested. Both of them passed away in 2020. Unfortunately, the case never made it to trial. In January 2022, Jason Franklin Sr. lost his life due to a respiratory illness while in prison. In June 2022, 50-year-old Jay Franklin also lost his life due to a drunk driver. Investigators with the cold case team described it as a heart-wrenching loss. Jay's stepmother, Kathy Vinette, said, 
I think he's the bravest person I ever met. To be able to basically rip his whole life apart and put it out there. Kathy Vanette is married to Jay Franklin's stepfather, Henry Vanette. Henry was married at one point to Joyce Vanette, Jay Franklin's mother. Without the suspect and the main witness, investigators officially closed Stephanie's case. Vanette currently lives in Alabama and hasn't been formally charged or arrested yet. On February 26, 1999, human remains were discovered in a wooded area near the intersection of Clifton Spring Road and Clifton Spring Church Road in Decatur, Georgia. An autopsy concluded that the remains belonged to an African-American boy between the ages of 5 and 7. He was wearing a blue and white plaid shirt, red denim jeans, and brown Timberland boots. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, authorities were unable to determine the cause and manner in which the boy lost his life. Unfortunately, they were also unable to identify him. The case went cold for many years. In May of 2020, a tipster came forward after seeing an artistic rendering of the unidentified child distributed by authorities. The tipster contacted the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and provided information about a woman named Teresa and Bailey Black. Black was living in Charlotte, North Carolina, with her six-year-old son, William Deshaun Hamilton. In December of 1998, without notice, she withdrew William from school and then moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Black later returned to Charlotte the following year, but without William. According to detectives, she gave conflicting accounts at the time regarding her son's whereabouts. The tipster believed that the boy found in Georgia was William because he looked similar. The DeKalb County Police Department, along with county prosecutors, later followed up on the lead and resumed actively investigating the case. Early in 2022, DNA linked Black to the child's remains. She was arrested in Phoenix, Arizona, on June 29, 2022. She is currently waiting to be taken to Georgia. Authorities have not specified how William's life was taken or a possible motive. Angeline Hartman, the Director of Communications at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, said, This case is the perfect example of why we never give up hope. For more than two decades, a woman in Charlotte followed her gut feeling that something wasn't right. She made phone calls, scoured the internet, and talked to anyone who would listen. We're grateful she never stopped until she found that rendering of William online and gave investigators the missing piece to help solve a 23-year-old mystery. William was a bright and artistic six-year-old who possessed a keen sense of humor, according to those who knew him. Investigators are now seeking the public's assistance to help piece together a more concrete timeline of Black and William's movements. Authorities say Black worked at a now-defunct Atlanta strip club known as Pleasers and may have been getting assistance from the Atlanta Day Shelter for Women and Children for a brief period. 23-year-old Shannon Lloyd lived in Orange County, California, in 1986. She was a tomboy who loved horses and had an adventurous soul. On May 20th, Shannon's body was found inside her bedroom in Garden Grove. She had been assaulted and strangled. Shannon's older brother, Tom Lloyd, had this to say at the time, It's hard for me to fathom how anyone could take into the person's life like it was nothing and just discard them. Investigators collected male DNA belonging to the suspect from the crime scene. In 2003, authorities linked what happened to Shannon to the cold case of Renee Cavus. The body of 27-year-old Renee was found on a road near El Toro Marine Base in Irvine, California, in 1989. When investigators entered the suspect's DNA profile in Shannon's case into the combined DNA index system, they noticed that the same man was responsible for taking the lives of both Shannon and Renee. Unfortunately, his identity could not be determined. In 2021, the Orange County District Attorney's investigative genetic genealogy team identified a Las Vegas man named Reuben J. Smith as a possible suspect. Smith lived in Orange County in the 1980s. He was forced to give his DNA in 1998 after being arrested in Las Vegas for assault and attempting to take the life of a woman. In July of 2022, it was confirmed that the DNA evidence from his arrest matched the DNA found at the crime scene of both Shannon and Renee. Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer said, Because of the advent of science, there's no case that's cold anymore. Every case is potentially solvable. Justice does not have an expiration date, whether a crime happened 40 years ago or 4 minutes ago.
The residents of Orange County can have confidence that the law and force in this county will not rest until justice is served. The loved ones of Renee Cavis and Shannon Lloyd have the answers to the questions they've been asking for more than three decades. The third unknown victim of Smith that survived said, the evil in him. I know if I didn't fight, I was going to die. It was horrible. The things that he did, the things that he said. Though she was able to fight him off and escape, she said she is still haunted by him. One year after being arrested in 1998, Smith took his own life at 39 years old. This is infuriating the victims' families themselves said that all their questions can't be answered. They know who and where, but not why. Detectives are now looking into the possibility that Smith could be implicated in other cases. On July 11, 1983, the body of 41-year-old Linda Lawson was found at the end of Memorial Highway in Tampa, Florida. Investigators said that she had been assaulted, shot in the head, and then dumped in the bushes. Linda was a freelance photographer who grew up in New York and had moved to Tampa as an adult. About a month later on August 19, 1983, the body of 19-year-old Barbara Graham was found behind an office in the Tampa Heights area. She had also been assaulted before her life was taken. Barbara was described as a friendly outgoing teenager from Tampa who had a job at the mall and liked to walk to stay fit. A man by the name of Robert Dubwall soon became a suspect in Barbara's case. He was convicted because a bite mark analysis expert said that Robert was responsible for a bite mark on Barbara's face. Dubois denied any involvement and contacted the Innocence Project. In 2020, with the help of advancements in DNA and the Conviction Review Unit, Du Bois was exonerated after spending 37 years in jail for a crime he did not commit. The Conviction Review Unit then went on to do more DNA testing to see who was responsible for taking the life of Barbara Graham. After further DNA testing, they realized that not one man was responsible, but two. They also determined that these two were responsible for many crimes in the Tampa area in 1983. The two men are 58-year-old Amos Robinson and 57-year-old Abraham Scott. They took the lives of both Barbara Graham and Linda Lawson. They are already serving life sentences, but investigators want to make sure that their crimes against Barbara and Linda do not go unpunished. Investigators are working hard to find other crimes that Robinson and Scott are responsible for. Linda Sheffield, who was Linda Lawson's niece, close friend, and roommate, had this to say, when it happened, it was shock and disbelief, whereas now it's more retrospective. This is a day I never thought would come. So to have somebody accountable for what they did, not only to my aunt, but to everyone else and every other family they touched, is beyond anything I would have expected. It means everything to me. State Attorney Andrew Warren, who announced the two indictments in August 2022, said, When we created the Conviction Review Unit, it was the first in Tampa Bay and one of the first in Florida. The CRU reviews plausible claims of innocence. It's there to safeguard against wrongful convictions. As we see today, in the rare case when the wrong person is convicted, the actual criminals get away with the crime. But for those victims, that stops now. This shows the power of a conviction review unit to right wrongs, uncover the truth, and deliver justice for victims, even after almost 40 years. 22-year-old Christine McCorder and her 31-year-old aunt, Beatrice Daniels, were fatally shot between 6 p.m. January 2nd and 11.50 a.m. January 3rd, 2009. In their apartment at the Chestnut Terrace Housing Complex in Huntington County, Pennsylvania, the women were both shot in the head. Christine's four-month-old daughter and four-year-old son were left behind in the apartment. Neighbors discovered the women's bodies after the four-year-old son asked them for help. Droplets of blood were taken into evidence from the crime seen by investigators. The initial DNA report concluded blood collected from the stairs and interior doors of the apartment were all deposited from an unidentified male. Over the years as DNA advanced, a DNA profile of the suspect could be created using the droplets. On March 14, 2016, Trooper David Clement submitted the DNA profile to DNA Solutions. They then forwarded it to Parabon Nano Labs based in Reston, Virginia. Parabon Nano Labs used the DNA to create an image of what the suspect might look like. It showed a black male with brown to black hair, medium to light complexion, and green or hazel eyes. On July 12, 2018, 
Trooper Dana Martini contacted Tom Shaw, a certified forensic artist and employee for Parabon Nanolabs. He was asked to conduct a genetic genealogy analysis of the DNA recovered at the crime scene. On October 9, 2018, Parabon provided a report on the genetic genealogy of the DNA and identified Mariko Johnson as a potential match. Johnson's appearance also matched with the image of the suspect they had created. Investigators found that Christine was acquainted with Johnson's then-girlfriend Cynthia Swan. Investigators interviewed Johnson for the first time at his home on December 12, 2019. Johnson admitted that he knew Christine and Beatrice because of Cynthia but denied ever setting foot in Christine's home. Johnson provided investigators with a DNA sample via a swab of his mouth. The sample was then sent off for analysis by the State Police Lab in Harrisburg on December 19, 2019. On January 3, 2020, the lab reported that Johnson's DNA matched blood evidence found on the stairs and interior doors at the crime scene. Investigators then compared Johnson's time card to the estimated time Christine and Beatrice's lives were taken. On January 22, 2020, the state police received time cards from Johnson's then-employer, the New York Department of Corrections, which confirmed he was off work January 2, 2009, and started his January 3rd shift at 7 a.m. State police estimate the time it takes to travel the 294 miles between Christine Beatrice's home and Johnson's then workplace is 4 hours and 43 minutes. Troopers Thomas and Martini interviewed the suspect's half-brother, Carol Broda's Johnson Jr. of Connecticut, who told the officers he thought his late father owned a 25 caliber, and that Mariko Johnson inherited their father's belongings when he passed away in 1998. Thomas and Martini interviewed Cynthia Swan, Johnson's ex-girlfriend, February 20, 2020, and learned from Swan that she was originally supposed to travel with Christine from Philadelphia to Mount Union on January 1, 2009, and stayed for the weekend, but decided at the last minute to remain in Philadelphia with the man, Benjamin June. Swan told troopers it was around this time Johnson found out Swan was having an affair with June. The last incoming text on Christine's cell phone was from Swan, asking Christine to call her. Christine did not respond to Swan's text. On July 28, 2020, Thomas and Martini spoke with Robert Sean Spade, the father of Christine's oldest child. Spade told the troopers he visited Christine, Beatrice, and the children the evening of January 2, 2009. Spade reported the women kept the apartment very clean, that he didn't observe blood-like drops anywhere in the apartment, and that it was unlike them to leave a spill or mess. In May of 2022, 47-year-old Mariko Tyrone Johnson was arrested in Newport News, Virginia, and charged with taking the lives of Christine and Beatrice. He will soon be transported to Pennsylvania by state police to face charges against him. 21-year-old Heather and Williams lived in an apartment in Leon Valley, Texas, in 2005. On February 22, Heather's friends got concerned when they could not reach her. The friends entered her apartment through a sliding glass door, and everyone's worst fears were realized as they found Heather's body in her bedroom. Heather's hands had been severed. Her clothes were burned in an apparent effort to conceal evidence. It was also determined that she had been assaulted. Neighbors of Heather told police they heard her arguing with a man the previous day. They described shuffling sounds and then silence at 5 a.m. in the morning. Investigators questioned a lot of people close to Heather. One of those people was Jose Bolomaro Flores. He went to high school with her and stayed in touch afterwards. Flores was also one of the last to see her alive. Flores denied any involvement, and the DNA collected from Heather's body that belonged to the suspect was not strong enough to match to anyone. Six years later, in 2011, 30-year-old Esmerila Herrera's life was taken in a similar fashion to Heather's. She lived in San Antonio, Texas. Her body was found tied to her bed on March 2nd. She had been bludgeoned and strangled. Another fire had been set in an attempt to conceal evidence, this time set in multiple places and large enough that firefighters arrived to put down the blaze. A month after Esmeralda's life was taken, Jose Flores was arrested in connection with her case. The charges against him were dropped a month later, and a request to further investigate the case was denied. In 2015, then-District Attorney Nico Lahu decided to take another look. Then in December 2016, 
Flores was again arrested. This time, he was charged with taking the lives of Heather and Esmeralda. DNA linked him to both cases. According to San Antonio officials, the pandemic slowed down the pace of corporate proceedings considerably. In early 2022, District Judge Melissa Skinnerner decided that all sides had waited long enough. But then on the eve of jury selection for the trial, Flores took responsibility. The 41-year-old Flores was then sent to three separate life sentences. Heather's mother Donna Ellis had this to say during a victim impact statement read during the sentencing, Every fiber of my being wants you to suffer and live in fear just as my Heather did, just as Esmeralda did. Today, I take back my life. I forgive you. Esmeralda's family had a victim advocate read a letter to Flores. The letter reportedly wished him pain and suffering. 76-year-old Helen Vogt lived in Erie, Pennsylvania, in July 1988. She was recently widowed as her husband Herbert passed away four months earlier in February. Erie police were called to Helen's townhouse at 7.15 a.m. on July 23, 1988. A witness grew alarmed after seeing Helen's 1988 Buick LeSabre back out of her garage at a high rate of speed, with the driver of the car wearing a towel wrapped around his head. The witness went to check on Helen and found her body and then called the police. Helen was stabbed with two kitchen knives and a two-pronged fork. An autopsy determined that she had suffered more than 50 stab wounds to her hands, face, neck, chest, and back. A witness who lived next door told police that she heard muffled sounds consistent with screaming, coming from Helen's townhouse at about 10.30 p.m. the previous evening. The witness also said she heard noises of furniture moving, as well as people going up and down the stairs. Investigators described the house as ransacked, dresser drawers were pulled open, and items were thrown about the townhouse. Helen was known to keep money, bonds, and personal paperwork in a briefcase at her home. But when detectives opened it, the briefcase was empty. Other items missing included credit cards, a white purse, a watch, and Helen's diamond ring that she never took off. Detectives found no sign of forced entry. They did, however, find blood on a washcloth in Helen's shower. There was also blood taken from Helen's kitchen sink. It did not belong to her, so police theorized that the suspect accidentally cut himself during the attack. On August 1, 1988, about a month after Helen's life was taken, her car was found in Dayton, Ohio. It was located in a parking garage next to a Greyhound bus station. Investigators also found that three days before Helen lost her life, she met with her lawyers and changed her will. She left half her estate to her daughter, Bonnie. The other half was to be split between her two grandchildren, Bethany and Jeremy. Investigators got a search warrant to obtain samples of blood, saliva, hair, and complete handprints from Helen's family members to be compared to the blood found at the crime scene. It was submitted to the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab in 1990, but results were inconclusive as DNA was not advanced enough. In 2022, the DNA was again entered into the crime lab. This time, it confirmed that Helen's grandson, Jeremy Brock, was responsible. He was 21 years old back in 1988. In July of 2022, 55-year-old Jeremy C. Brock was arrested at his home in Austin, Texas. He is currently at Travis County Jail in Austin and will be taken to Erie County, Pennsylvania, soon. Erie Police Chief Dan Spazarni said at the news conference, with the advancement of forensic technology, the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab in Greensburg, Pennsylvania was able to reanalyze the previously submitted evidence. In September 2019, human remains belonging to a black male were found on the roof of a building in downtown Biloxi, Mississippi, near the 800 block of Martha Street. The building was abandoned and had been unoccupied for at least 15 years. There were no clues to the unknown person's identity, and investigators could not find a missing person's record that matched what they knew about the remains. In August 2021, the Mississippi State Medical Examiner's Office, Biloxi Police Department, and Harrison County Coroner's Office teamed up with Othram Inc. to use forensic-grade genome sequencing to help generate new leads that might identify the unknown man or his next of kin. Othram built a genealogical profile from the skeletal remains sent by the Mississippi State Medical Examiner's Office. Carla Davis, a Mississippi native and genealogist, performed genealogical research. Investigators' leads were passed back to law enforcement, 
and an additional investigation by Biloxi investigators confirmed that the identity of the unknown man found on the roof was Gary Lee White from Jackson, Mississippi. He was born on August 29, 1952. At the time of his discovery in 2019, he would have been 67 years old. How he lost his life remains unclear, and an investigation continues into the circumstances. But for his family, it brings great relief that the part of the case related to what happened to him is now solved. On the morning of July 15, 1982, gravedigger George Keyes discovered the body of a Caucasian woman in the rear of the Cedar Ridge Cemetery in Blairstown, New Jersey. The victim's face had been beaten beyond recognition with an undetermined object. The medical examiner estimated that she was in her late teens or early 20s, and examination indicated that she had attempted to fight back or defend herself, as trauma to her hands and arms was observed. The body was clad in a red short sleeve shirt and a skirt. After seeing images of the girl's clothing in a newspaper, a witness named Emery Lattenberg told officials that she remembered seeing a girl wearing the same clothing as the victim, purchasing cigarettes on July 13, 1982 just two days before her body was found. The witness described the victim's clothing, and it was traced to a manufacturer in the Midwestern United States. Some people also mentioned buying similar clothes at a store in Long Island, New York. The victim, initially known as Princess Doe, was buried on January 20, 1983, after remaining unidentified for over five months. Donated funds were used to pay for a coffin and headstone engraved with the text, A Princess Doe missing from home, remembered by all. For many years, Princess Doe was thought to be Diane Ginny Di, a missing teenager from San Jose, California, who vanished on July 30, 1979. However, in 2003, DNA comparison confirmed that Princess Doe was not Diane Di. In 1999, a woman named Donna Kinlaw claimed that her husband, Arthur Kinlaw, was responsible for Princess Doe's death. Donna did not provide detailed information, and without Princess Doe's identification, it was challenging to prove her claims. Arthur was found guilty of other crimes, but the link to Princess Doe remained uncertain. The case was revisited in 2012, with a new composite sketch, different reconstructions, and isotope analysis indicating possible locations in the United States where Princess Doe might have lived. In 2021, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children partnered with Australian Forensics to help identify Princess Doe. DNA extraction and profiling were successful, leading to a potential candidate. On February 22, 2022, Innovative Forensics announced a candidate for Princess Doe, and investigators met with Robert Alanyak Jr. in West Babylon, New York, believing he was her brother. A DNA sample was collected from Princess Doe's sister, and on April 9, 2022, the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification identified Princess Doe as Dawn Alanyak. The announcement was made on July 15, 2022, the 40th anniversary of her discovery. Dawn Alanyak was just 17 years old when her life was taken. Arthur Kinlaw has confessed again, and investigators are working to piece together Dawn's movements leading up to her demise. Like this video and subscribe our channel.